Tradition number 10 will be the gift of a blade. In 2015 and 2019, couples Rune and Elizabeth Dalseth and Dorian and Charlie Used became two of the only couples in modern times to have authentic ancient Viking wedding ceremonies, complete with blood sacrifices, hog roasts, and swords. Swords, while it may come as a surprise or not given how the Norse are, were integral to the wedding ceremony. In fact, it's how a girl was even shown to be on the market. When a girl came of age for marriage, which is young, but far older than just about anywhere else in ancient Europe, a father let it be known that she was available for marriage by gifting his daughter an empty sheath she would attach to her belt or girdle. Now, this didn't mean she or her father would have to accept the first knife just plopped in. Many women in Viking culture didn't wed until their mid-twenties. If a suitor liked the girl, he would put a puko blade in the sheath, at which the girl would keep if she was interested in him as consent for him to attempt a courtship. Men would sometimes doll up these pukos to try and curry more favor. However, it is noted by some historians that girls would also place blades into other girls' holsters. It's unknown if it correlates with same-sex romance or friendship. Blades will return in prominence a few more times in this countdown. Tradition number nine is that of the pregame. In the days before a wedding, the bride and grooms would be separated so as to shed their old selves in preparation for finding their new selves with one another. For the bride, this meant being stripped of old clothing and any symbols of her unwed status, such as her kransen, a gilt circulet worn by Scandinavian girls on their heads, situated on the hairline. If you've seen the children's movie How to Train Your Dragon, the character Astrid wears one. These are symbols of virginity, and by removing her kransen in preparation for her bridal hair, which we'll touch on in the next segment, she was shedding her innocence. During this time, the bride also cleansed herself in a bathhouse. Hot stones would be placed into water to produce steam, and she would be accompanied by mother, sister, teachers, friends, or any other woman she desired the company of. The bride used birch twigs as switches on their skin to less than metaphorically beat out any dirt and symbolically wash away the bride's maiden status. Once the bath was finished, the bride was doused with cold water to close the pores and end the cleansing. Grooms didn't have it as easy as they usually do, and they also underwent symbolic rituals. His attendants would be his father, married brothers, or other married male friends. In order to rid themselves of any bachelorhood and destroy all vestiges of the unmarried self, Viking men participated in a symbolic sword ceremony by breaking into a grave. That's right, pre-wedding night, the husband-to-be would grab a pickaxe and get to work on burying the dead and retrieve a sword from an ancestor skeleton. Through this action, he entered death as a boy and emerged into life as a man reborn. After this, he too would attend the bathhouse, beat himself raw with twigs, while gaining insight and instruction on husbandly and fatherly duties from his attendants. On number 8, Shotgun Wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number 7, no objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy-nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flush out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama, discovered after marriage vows were exchanged, caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why 
by the Speak Now or Forever Hold Your Peace was introduced. At number six, Shoes! Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings and apparently whoever cast Catches it is the next to get married. Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the aisle. Now, this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever, so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened. You had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration, and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package. Well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually, veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paperwork work side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me, but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not 
least, and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Rite. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition, and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place. Like, why was it even in place? Someone clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's Rite was something even more horrific. The Droit de Seigneur was a feudal rite that existed in medieval Europe that gave the Lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your Lord had a particular vendetta against you? It wouldn't be surprising. This right could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village, even if they didn't want to get married. It was ridiculous. However, late Middle Age and Renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first knight or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dwight de Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. Number 10, Nati Nati. There's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times. We didn't know, but now we do. So there's really no excuse for acting up. A very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the Lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number nine, pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggle to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunt it on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You could be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Tradition number eight is, as mentioned, the bridal crown. The bridal crown represents a literal crown, but also that of a natural crown, aka hair, which was more crucial to the Vikings than any other part of a woman, as it symbolized virility and sensuality. When it came time for her to remove her crown sin, the bride would receive her bridal crown from her mother. This bridal crown would be adorned with endless ornaments, crystals, animal bones, rune stones, but it could also be made of purely natural materials and decorated with flowers, straw, wood, and vines. The longer the hair and the more ornaments it had, the better off the couple was believed to be. The next morning, the bride's hair would be tied up and covered with a cloth to show her status as a wife. Married Viking women would not always continue to cover their hair, but would wind it back into braids, buns, ponytails, and other risen hairstyles. Tradition number seven is in the garb. The hair of the bride was the most important aesthetic element. Everything else seemingly falls by the wayside. The bride often wore a long linen gown embellished with beads or intricate embroidery. The groom donned his newest and brightest of tunic and trousers, and also often linen and embroidered. Both parties would don a belt, and the groom's being a symbol of his strength and ability to protect. The more weapons holstered, the better, but the groom always carried a pickaxe or hammer at least. The bride's was a symbol of her fertility, the clasp of her bridal belt intricate and dainty, drawing the eye as a reminder of what is to come when she and the groom are alone. Vikings loved to wear jewelry, and wedding attire was no exception. The bride would wear a necklace, earrings, bracelets, often made of silver or gold, and often more than one layer. The groom would wear a brooch or an arm ring, symbolizing his status and power. The final layer would be exactly that, an extra layer. Vikings lived in cold climates, and it was common for them to wear coats or cloaks to keep warm. Seeing as the Viking wedding ceremony exclusively happened outside, no matter the season, a fur coat usually was of great importance. The groom's coat was usually a dark color, an animal he or a man in his family had personally hunted. This shows his prowess as a man and his role as a provider. The woman's fur coat would be a pale color, a 
symbol of her purity and as the sweet animal captured by the ferocious hunter. Tradition number six is tying the knot. This classic wedding phrase is one that used to be quite literal. Called a hand fasting ceremony, a multitude of pagan religions had their own versions of this. For example, the Roman brides as mentioned in the Bumblebee video, Top 10 Scary Marriage Traditions in Ancient Rome, wear an intricate knot belt that must be undone by the groom. The use of the knot to symbolize the joining of couples originates with the Celts, who were famous for the symbolic use of knots and knot patterns. Hand fasting in the most traditional of senses was done by the Vikings, wherein the couple's hands are tied together with some cord or cloth by the officiant, quite literally binding them and officiating their marriage. They are tying the knot. Moreover, this practice was important to the Vikings as it indicated that the couple was getting married by choice, not by force. The couples I mentioned at the beginning of our video incorporated hand fasting in their ceremonies, but even those not recreating Viking weddings still participate as the trend is popular in Europe. Apart from exchanging rings, house keys, and tying the knot, the Viking bride and groom also exchanged swords. This symbolized the transfer of protection between the grooms and the bride's families. They would each exchange ancient swords from their own families, thus why the groom went and dug one up pre-wedding night. Furthermore, it united the two families that were now responsible for supporting and protecting one another. Tradition number five is the godly blessing. First and foremost, Viking weddings always and only took place on Fridays, otherwise known as Frigg's Day or Freya's Day, as the queen goddess represented marriage, love, and fertility. To hold a marriage on any other day than one of the Norse goddesses would have been a bad omen. Viking wedding rituals stated that the wedding also had to be held between the end of the harvest and before the snowfall, and that you needed to accumulate enough food and shelter for everyone invited. You also had to have enough bride ale for the new couple to drink for the first moon cycle of their wedding. Meanwhile, during the feast post ceremony, the hammer or pickaxe that the groom carries as part of his groom's attire would finally play its role. The bride was expected to ask for Thor's blessing, and so the pickaxe or hammer wielded by the groom, meant to represent Majon, is placed on the bride's lap. The placement of the symbol of Thor's manhood in between the bride's womb and hoo-ha is highly symbolic, as he represented male fertility and was believed by playing into this cruel joke, he may deliver you, the bride, strong children. Tradition number four is a cat in a box. As the groom would hand over his house keys to the bride, the congregation of those witnessing the wedding would bestow the gift of life to fill the home in preparation for children. Cats. Lots of cats. This was done to honor Freya, the goddess of love, who according to legend, drove a chariot led by cats. Nursing female cats and their kittens were often seen as the most ideal to give as they would be a representation of the bride's future to come, and help her set up the household and get into the routine of caring for something small and defenseless. Well, only semi. I've had my fair share of cat scratches and bites. I would argue they defend themselves just fine. Tradition number three is honeymoon. Have you ever wondered where the word honeymoon came from? Well, it comes from the Scandinavian practice of drinking honey mead, which nowadays is pretty hard to get a hold of. It takes a long time to make small batches and requires tedious preservation. But man, it is incredible, so if you get a chance to try it, you absolutely should, as long as you're over 19. And you needed enough of this delicious honey mead made and provided by friends and family to last you the entire duration of your first moon cycle, one month after your wedding, as it was believed to increase the chance of conceiving a child. As you can imagine, loose inhibitions would lead to a higher likelihood. It's also a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink bride ale together at their post-wedding feast, as their union was only binding once they did so. The first serving was presented to the groom by his wife in a vessel known as the Loving Cup. The bride might recite a formal verse while presenting the ale. Before drinking it, the groom consecrated the ale to Thor by making the sign of the hammer over it, and toasted to Odin. He sipped and passed the cup to his bride, who made a toast to Freya before drinking. Tradition number two is giving chase. When your wedding ceremony is done nowadays, the bride and groom leave while their attendees applaud and whoop, and everyone meets with everyone later, sometimes at a secondary location for post-wedding festivities. However, in Viking weddings, this wasn't the case. Your first job as a bride and groom was to aggressively compete in a competition as if you were children again. A race. Called the bride running, or alternately, the bride groom's ride, this ritual originated in pagan days where the bridal and groom parties, as well as the bride and groom's additional guests, had to race to the feast location. Whichever party lost served liquor to all the winnings all night. You better hope you have an athletic family. Once in the feast hall, the groom buried the sword into the ceiling, and the depths of which the sword sunk symbolized the enduring nature of the union. Things changed in the Christian days, however, and the fun run turned simply into the two parties walking separately from the site of the ceremony to the feast, which is how we've ended up with the far more boring modern version we do today. When Christianity spread, it also carried the tradition of the marriage door from Rome. The Christian Viking version was the groom actually blocking the door so that the bride had to enter with his assistance, completing her symbolic journey 
journey from maidenhood to marriage. Tradition number one is animal sacrifice. Despite the wealth of Viking wedding knowledge that seems to be available, I will commentate briefly on how reconstructing their ceremonies has proven to be immensely difficult. This is because when the Viking sagas were first written, Christianization had already started wiping out their traditional cultures, temples, runestones, and overall beliefs, leaving many details undocumented or struck off the record. However, we are very confident that sacrifice made its way into marriage ceremony. The sacrifice was to draw attention of the gods to the ceremony and assure their presence and blessings, and so animals associated with fertility were the ones used. For Thor, a goat. For Freya, a sow. And for Freya, a boar or horse. The Gothi, the person responsible for the wedding, usually sacrificed the animal right at the wedding site. The animal's blood was collected in a bowl and placed on the altar. Then, a bundle of fur twigs was used to be dipped in the blood and splatter it on the couple, conferring the blessings of the gods. The blood is then drizzled over little figures of the gods placed at the altar, all meant to symbolize the union of them and regular people. And yes, Rune and Elizabeth, Dalseth, and Dorian and Charlie Eust are couples who recreated authentic Viking weddings in 2015 and 19, also included this part of the ceremony. All right. It's everywhere right now, so obviously covering it first. Number 10, how a blind date leads to being one in a thousand. It's been controversy since day one with Meghan and Harry, not because they did anything wrong per se, not at least at first, more so the usual sensualization drama that has to occur whenever a prince chooses a cool Hollywood gal to be his biddy. As you'll learn in this video, this was not the first time this has happened. The couple met on a blind date in 2016, and the relationship was confirmed in November of that year, immediately initiating waves of hatred and bigotry onto the couple for the Megan's ancestry career and how she even breathed. Really anything the media could latch onto. This onslaught is what promoted the couple to step back from the royal family in 2020 and instead splitting time between the UK and North America and finding their own financial endeavors. They also made the rare royal move to take legal action against paparazzi for the excessive negative tabloid attention. Part of which was exasperated by Megan's dad sharing all her personal business with literally anyone who'll listen. That's part of the reason Megan only had one guest of her own at their wedding that contained thousands, her mother. Since their marriage, all the scandal has revolved around the Oprah interview, podcasts, novels, and broadcast interviews. But now, as of this week, it's coming from suspicions that Harry and Meghan are taking a break. This follows Meghan's 20 mil Spotify agreement being cancelled and causing apparent financial plight for two people that are already worth millions of dollars. Evidently, living all your lives out loud in this fashion from day one of a relationship will halt its healthy progression. But a source close most of them is saying that this time apart in different continents isn't a breakup, rather time apart couple needs. I want to follow that up with the very similar story of the American divorcee, number 9. Like the gravy and mash that the Brits oh so love, this is scandal ladled on a scandal. In the early 1930s, Wallace Simpson was married to Prince Edward was in line to become the king. By 1934, rumors had already started about the two having an affair, something they insisted that until their dying days never occurred. Anyways, when King George dropped in January of 1936 and Edward is crowned, he calls up Wallace who proceeds to immediately divorce her husband. This now made her a two-time divorcee, something the Prime Minister at the time stressed to Edward as being a bad idea. At the time, divorce was frowned upon, and the thought of a monarch marrying a divorcee, unheard of. Joke's on him though, because by December the Prime Minister is invited to the palace for a dinner where he's told by the new king his plans to marry Wallace anyway and abdicate. The Prime Minister and Edward's mother, Queen Mary, respond pretty much the same. What is wrong? with you. Edward's reign lasted 324 days before he abdicated to marry the woman he loved. The couple was married in France on June 3rd of 1937 and promptly shipped to the Bahamas by Edward's family. Why? Oh, well because a real scandal with these two is that they were Yahtzee sympathizers during World War II, a time when their own country was fighting the Germans, the same Germans and dictator, hint hint, that they went and hung out with and encouraged. Yikes. And were able to wed. No parental consent required, which is the next on the list. As people lived short lives in the middle age period, parents of nobility often made arrangements early on and a few months old baby could be betrothed to another few month old baby and then raised in their respective royal nurseries until they hit that jolly old consummation age in their teens. Think Sleeping Beauty being promised to the prince in the Disney movie. Peasants and commoners however were able to marry as they wished and parental consent wasn't even required. It was like this for centuries. But there's always those folks who didn't like when two separate religions mixed and there's always those who tried to take advantage of the easy I do policy. So good things never last. And it didn't. When this law finally changed in England in the 18th century, the old rules still applied in Scotland, making towns just over the border such as Gretna Green a destination
solution for English couples defying their family and wanting to marry without their consent. A brief personal story for you guys. So my mother is a traveler and decided to visit the famous Gretna Green town and wedding site where the tradition of Gretna Green marriages still lives today. My mother was taking photos and reading history plaques when she got taken aside by her tour guide. A couple whose family wasn't supportive of their relationship, just like the couples of the past, had shown up and decided to marry spontaneously in the traditional way. They had chosen Gretna Green for its historical significance to their unsupported love, and they needed two witnesses. The tour guide could act as one witness, but they needed a second. So my mother stood as a witness for a young couple who had just traveled to the border to marry at Gretna Green alone, experiencing the same pilgrimage thousands of couples had done in history. So on the topic of witnesses, how did that get started? Up next is witness Schmidtness. In the Middle Ages, the household was headed by a husband, and his wife was the center of the family life and economic productivity. As John Wellis said in 1486, more things are necessary for a household than four naked thighs. And he used this retort upon hearing that his alleged betrothed, Alice Billingham, had publicly declared they were married. Instead of saying it straight, John was chastising Alice for suggesting they could legitimize their romantic relationship without the necessary social status and financial stability, not just intercourse. Alice, however, goes, na 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 na, nah, bro, I got the receipts, which were her witnesses to the fact that John had asked her to be his wife on the feast of St. Valentine's that same year, which historically, yes, has always been a romance hallmark holiday, asking her for her hand so that she could be his Valentine forever. These two contrasting stories, however, give us a peephole into the tension between the expectation of love versus intercourse, and then the making of a good and economically fortuitous marriage in the Middle Ages. Alice says, you proposed to me with love, therefore that is our marriage basis. John says, I may have said I loved you, but I won't make a wife out of a... Well, you get it. So while God was the ultimate witness, that's why couples could just say stuff like be mine forever and become legally married, it's nice and all, but it was highly recommended to have witnesses to avoid uncertainty like the Alice and John situation. Because they didn't just sign your wedding doc back then, they stopped your husband from wandering off. I've done a lot of talk on the ins and outs of marriage, but how about kiss to be kissed, the medieval wedding ceremony itself? So there was some errands to run leading up to the big day. First of all, Long before the actual wedding, bands were called, which were literally three Sundays leading up, someone stands outside the church and hollers that your wedding day is coming up. It's done so that people can come find out about the celebration and come along to the wedding, but also those who had objections had the opportunity to voice them. They also put up signs on the church door with information, so if you're out just buying turnips one day and saw your husband's name and face on a poster, you could go up to the medieval lost and found and say, hey, yo, this one one's mine. Wedding's off. A wedding ceremony could not be held on a Catholic holiday or on Sundays. A couple could not be married during a time of fasting. They can't be married by someone who had killed someone else. So make sure you got all those things written down to avoid. When weddings started to occur at churches, they were done at the front doors. Nobles married with big parades and elaborate garbs, while peasants sort of kicked it and whatever they had. The couple would exchange vows, usually some Jesus-y stuff, and the priests asked one last time if anybody's got any beef with these two getting hitched. After that, the groom presented his bride with a wedding ring, burlesque by the priest, and the ring was placed on each finger of the bride before landing on the ring finger and amen, the ring stays there. Then the procession goes into the church, a special mass began and people prayed for the couple and their future offspring. After the mass, the priest kissed the groom on both cheeks and finally the groom would kiss the bride. But sometimes you can say I do and have a whole ceremony and still have to prove it. In the middle ages getting married was easy for Christians living in western Europe. According to the church, which created and enforced marriage law, couples didn't need permission of their families or priests to officiate until towards the end of the 18th century. And though the church controlled or tried to control marriage, couples didn't need to marry in a church until the 18th century. So medieval legal records show people getting married on the road, down at the pub, at a friend's house, in bed, really anywhere. All that was required for a valid binding marriage was the consent of the two people involved. So while tying the knot can take a matter of moments, proving you were married is a different story. The vast majority of marriage cases that came up before the courts were to enforce or prove that a marriage had been taken place in the first place. And marriage mix-ups bothered the clergy since, after much debate, theologians decided in the 12th century that marriage was a holy sacrament. The union of man and woman 
in marriage and intercourse represented the union of Christ in the church, and this was hardly symbolism to be taken lightly now. So they wrote up some laws and dished them out. The statutes issued by the English church in 1217 to 1219 include warnings such as no man should place a ring of reeds or another material, vile or precious, on the young woman's hands in jest, so that he might more easily fornicate with them. Lest he thinks himself to be joking, he pledge himself to the burden of matrimony. Another thing in those statutes was hold that peace. Not your pee though, I know it sounded similar, but you can do that on the streets anywhere, it's medieval times. Beautiful! Anywho, the bonds I mentioned earlier were introduced as part of the 1215 changes to try and flush out any impediments before a marriage took place. This could be someone is already married, or she's not a virgin or he's wanted for killing someone. There's range. Nevertheless, until the Reformation, there was no speak now or forever hold your peace. In the Middle Ages, problems discovered or revealed after marriage could have an enormous impact still. For example, Joan of Kent, who's remembered as Edward the Black Prince's wife and the mother of the future King Richard II, was married in her early teens. It was a whole Diana level spectacle with full publicity, a church service, her new boo was an aristocrat. But after about eight years of marriage, this marriage was overturned in the papal court and she was returned to a knight she had secretly married without her family's knowledge or approval when she was 12. Imagine that, spend 8 years with a dude only to be shipped back to some idiot I said I love you to when you were 12. If that still happened nowadays we'd all be locked in with our first crushes. Take a minute please and soak that horrible thought in. Anyways, it's difficult to know how many medieval people married for love or found love in their arranged marriage. There was certainly a distinction between free consent to marry and having a completely free choice. Now circling back to my earlier point where I explained the wedding day, how about the wedding night? Not a moment alone is next. Alright y'all have officially tied the knot and locked lips for the first time. You did some praying, now it's time for a meal, pretty normal stuff that lines up with nowadays. The peasant couple celebrated with their friends and family, drinking bridal ale for this special occasion and eating a meal traditionally made up of dishes brought by the wedding guests to help feed the community. That's right y'all, like a trailer park wedding, medieval receptions were potlucks. After the reception, a peasant couple may dance and enjoy their night, but a royal couple is ushered to the chamber to consummate the marriage in bed ASAP. The priest, the clergy, parents, really whoever wanted in on the action would come into the room, kick their feet up, and have some popcorn and tell the couple give us a show here. The bride needed to be a virgin at the time too, which had to be proven by blood being on the bed sheets. If there wasn't any, the whole wedding could be undone on the spot, which actually would be really hard for those women who don't bleed their first times. They they do exist. And of course, because there isn't those enough people in the room while your cherry's getting popped as is, a medieval wedding tradition allowed unmarried guests from the procession to also follow royal newlyweds into the room and take turns throwing the bride and groom stockings at them. Whoever managed to make a direct hit would presumably get married soon. Yeah, this is where the bouquet toss comes from. Then someone has to go retrieve it off the naked sweaty couple so someone else can have a throw. Truly a magical time of wedding traditions. Imposed witnesses, parental consent, church weddings. Yes, it was because of the confusing I do issue and a bunch of others I've listed, but it was also because of kidnap. So, over the last 20 years, historians have increasingly problematized consent we've heard of in the past, warning us not to project modern understanding of consent onto that medieval canon law. Today, consent is is defined by what is present instead of what is absent. Yes means yes, instead of no means no. In medieval times, the gap between coercion and consent was essentially a hairline. Women didn't have many legal options to deal with very persuasive or dangerous men who demanded their hand and would stop at nothing to achieve it. And consequently, the women often agreed to marry them for fear of their life. Because stopping at nothing often led to being captured. And with women being property, if said captor managed to return home and take the woman against her will before a brother, father, knight, whoever can do something about it, she becomes his property. These abductions then regularly end in marriage because of the damage of the deflowering caused to the victim's reputation. She'd never be wanted by anyone else and so the POS who can't understand the word no wins. To delineate between consent and coercion, canon laws dropped in the 1200s stated that the degree of pressure applied on an individual could not sway a constant man or woman, meaning that neither family members, romantic partner, a stranger, anyone could exert pressure on an individual to force their consent. However, the degree to which force is interpreted and is defined by each city or community, some communities stay stuck in old ways. And last, but never the least, is apparently you can be 
two into your wife. So, marriage aside from being a means of property exchange was also used by the church to regulate adult activities and carnal desires of the everyday person. Because any intercourse outside of marriage was a universal sin, but intercourse in marriage is only acceptable for procreation. Which means the church is trying to peddle that a good intimacy relationship was beneficial to your marriage, but neither desire nor pleasure should be involved or play a role in it. Because that's physically possible. They took this serious too, man. Like Thomas Aquinas warned that a man who slept with his wife solely for pleasure was treating her like a lady of the night. And St. Jerome stated in the 4th century that a man who is too passionately in love with his wife is an adulterer. This is a sentiment which remained pre prevalent up until the end of the 16th century. Not only was the purpose of intercourse within marriage made abundantly clear by the church, and still is, but there were many rules and regulations pertaining to the act itself. Like when the activity between the husband or wife was or wasn't permitted. That would be like a feast or fast day, Sundays, menstruation or pregnancy, while breastfeeding, and for 40 days after childbirth, also holidays, and holy days. This meant that on average, most married couples could illegally have intercourse less than once a week. Negative one time a week, you guys. But at least we had champs like Albert the Great who would throw ladies the proverbial bone every now and then. He defended women's carnal desires during pregnancy actually in a document, claiming that the fetus stimulated desire in women. A woman never desires relations so much as she does when she is pregnant. Medicine is most needed in the time of greatest illness. That's a hell of a sentence, a lot to unpack there, so let's just leave it as medieval marriage sucks. Number 10, spitting. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like Poo! some like browny green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually because, no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thor Radia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up perhaps. Number eight, Doormad Toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered and they're destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once not too long ago is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven, shards and shards. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. I think again. This is a part four and honestly, I could do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my god. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by 
wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems, and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all, not even close to being discreet. You can't put this stuff on the bus. It's not, they're, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, mm, there you go. Number five. Shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four in one shampoos that wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It was just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tefania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tefana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig? Then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a shit on a boat? Whale watching's fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think. I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. 
Baby Ray's is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Ray's is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. Mm. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesbro Pons bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box. A warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. All right, so you guys know my drill. So let's start off with the information most people may know a little bit more about already, such as dowries, which is a nice way for fathers to say, I will literally pay your family to get this chick out of my house. The arrangement of marriage was done by the bride and groom's parents. Royal or noblemen were sometimes able to choose their bride, but marriage back then was not based on love for the nobility. They were political arrangements. Husbands and wives were generally strangers until they first met, and if love was ever involved, it came after the couple had been married. But even if it didn't, most just sort of settled into a form of friendship or companionship or just living with each other. The arrangement of marriage was based on monetary worth. Noble girls equal fatter stacks. Meanwhile, peasant dowries didn't really happen often, and when they did, they were paid in utilitarian means. The family of a girl who was to be married would give a dowry to the family of the boy she was to marry. After the marriage was arranged, the wedding notice was posted up on the doors of the church and the notice was put up to ensure that there were no grounds for prohibiting the marriage by stating who was to be married and if anyone knew any reasons why they could not. But more on that in a little bit. Now, as mentioned, peasants were able to marry for love, but why make that choice? There was no marital benefits back then because it's marriage or burn and damnation. Throughout the Middle Ages, the church essentially presented women with two life options in order to escape the sin of Eve. You could become celibate, which ultimately was the preferred choice, or to become married and mothers. Um, you don't bathe, there's feces everywhere, there's the plague, and a man could just kill you tomorrow for rejecting him, and you wanna add kids to that equation? When there's no medicine either, pass. Hard, hard pass. Nunneries were literal havens for these single women because sure, you could be celibate and still live in town being a spinner or whatever, but again, you run the risk of some dude just jumping you and the courts blaming you for it and then doing something whack like cutting your nose off for it. Nunneries were female only. They kept things clean and locked up. So women could just try and have an ounce of peace in an era where existence was just to breed or feel bad about yourself. According to Host and CS, once a girl was physically ready to consummate a Okay, she met Aunt Flo, she was ready for marriage. However, since puberty came earlier for females than males, they could marry at a younger age. So, for peasants who were genuinely interested in marriage out of love, something that could only be done consensually on both sides, they were eligible once they'd hit their respective puberties. Number eight, the birth factory. Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. It was just one of the many factors. So when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially if you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. Number seven, wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell or spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding, and something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. 
Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle and then Yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number six, Mr. Steal Yo Girl. This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon-to-be wife. What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sounds just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. Hey, hey Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. Number five, Mamma Mia. The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you. Or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number four, arranged marriages. All this stuff sounds awful. And you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promised daughters to others. Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number three, marital disputes. I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I have to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. But it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not that far from the truth to say, that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I, as an internet comedian, cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner, bad. Life was a lot harder for the average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is, it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number two, mail order. This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options. Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number one, married games. This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then, till death do you part. And depending on if the church would even allow it, but however, in the yielding times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's no, you guys want, you guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. So, here's some weapons to deal with it. Go ahead, here you go. Crazy. Kicking off the list at number 10. Wiper, no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. 
Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Cause you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brickline pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy hit a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We've talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers were responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. <laughs> Though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably. I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No. I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, so great, you're like, why'd you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses in your body were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals. One run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The 
mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Number five, dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know, other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine, and I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops, and what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face, and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick, you ask? Radiation, they didn't know this yet, it was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face, now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what, at least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really 
great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches. The early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. And the wedding traditions of both ancient Rome and the ones of our modern day, we need to learn about number 10, the women of Sabine. So if you haven't seen it yet, we recently released the top 10 messed up marriage traditions in ancient Rome, and I definitely recommend giving these two videos a watch consecutively. As in that one, you'll learn more about the traditions and the ceremony itself. This video, more nitty gritty baby. So to recap, this story first takes place when Rome was first established, like fresh off the press, just a small military settlement in 753 BCE. As a result, Result, its entire population was men. Which don't get me wrong, Roman soldiers could work with the same way Greek ones could, but because their mommies had done all the work for them their entire lives and now they can't wash dishes or even a shirt, they sought out replacement mommies, aka wives. Where and how do you get wives when there are no women? The answer to that question was to steal any women of childbearing age from the neighboring township of Sabine. These women were ripped from their mothers and fathers and carried in large processions back to Rome where they were forced into marriage via physical their fathers, brothers, and former husbands came to wage war and win the women back, but the women of Sabine felt it was too late. Now forced into motherhood and marriage to the soldiers, the women of Sabine throw themselves in between the evil men who are now the fathers of their children and the men who they'd been stolen from, begging that bloodshed end, wanting to live neither fatherless nor widowed. So a truce is called, and Sabine and Rome united their communities. So let's do a traditional breakdown in the following part of the countdown. What traditions ended up coming from this? Number nine will be stolen goods. So one result of Rome literally starting off as a mass theft of ladies and their autonomy, it developed a super fun mindset and tradition that the only bride of value was one that hadn't been deflowered and had been stolen from her family. This went in two directions. So first, marriage continued to be theft, not like a ha ha ha, steal the bride. This was like actual theft of a person and a forceful marriage. This is how it was in the early days of Rome for a few hundo years. Obviously it can't stay that way forever because people do feel love and some people want to get married in a non effed up way so the tradition goes the second way that theft would be continued but as a consenting reenactment in a consenting reenactment after the marriage ceremony a bride would hug her father then hold her mother at which point the guests and the groomsmen would pull her from her mother's arms in a recreation of what happened to the Sabines and that she should cry out in pain and weep as she was heralded along the route to her new house even if they were faking it just as the Sabines had number eight clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells. Literal Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clamshells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay! In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. 
It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no! Like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw! Okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. Back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. Sp spearmint. Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one is, hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign. But a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <laughs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? <laughs> well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of 
excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you? Just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times for example, they had cutlery but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, Lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. 
number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health. And so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, yeah, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian laundry day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when laundry day came around. It was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry. Hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn. But the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. And yeah. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. This is so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years. The bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. 
The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's mealtimes, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair, and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I, have no, I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction obviously today, horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls, but where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. At number 10, Veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride's veil. These days, a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. Just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction, so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number 9. When Doves Cry I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well. They don't have a homing instinct. Whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see 
fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles, so they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing, they're riders much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but you do you. In our number eight spot today, we have the bridal veil. There are a lot of historical wedding traditions that have to do with warding off evil spirits. People were really concerned about that back in the day. This is one of the major factors behind why the bridal veil was created. Back in Roman times, the veil was actually a red sheet called a flamium, which was meant to look like fire so as to scare off any evil spirits that were lurking around. In Greece, the veil was often yellow for the same reason. Over time, the color changed, but the intent remained the same. It was worn as a sort of protection. In the end, another reason for the use of the veil was to assist in arranged marriages. What I mean by this is that back in the day, when marriage was simply more of a business exchange than anything, sometimes veils were used to hide the identity or appearance of the bride from the groom. Definitely not the most kind tradition there's ever been. In our number seven spot today, we have wedding rings. Both wedding and engagement rings are common in our society today, but this practice has been around for quite some time, although it used to mean a very different thing. The tradition of wedding ring exchange can be traced back to ancient Rome, but it wasn't an exchange that happened between partners at the wedding ceremony, and was instead something that was given by Roman men to the father of the bride as a symbol of his purchase. This practice later evolved into the bride being given a gold ring that she would wear, which was meant to symbolize the fact that the groom had placed his trust in her. He was trusting her with his property. As for the reason we wear rings on our fourth finger, well, rings have been worn on many fingers throughout history, but the reason why this finger was chosen was because it was believed that the fourth finger held a vein that led to the heart, which in Latin was called the vena amoris, or the vein of love. In our number six spot today, we have the bridal auction. Ancient Mesopotamia had a slew of rules and customs regarding marriage. There's one thing that the Roman historian Herodotus recorded quite well. While many of his stories are largely unreliable, this is one ancient wedding custom that has thankfully been lost to time. The bridal auction was exactly what it sounds like. It was an annual market where young, available women were auctioned off to be married. Those who were considered more beautiful were auctioned off first, and those who were deemed less desirable were auctioned after, along with a quote, monetary compensation, which was said to make up for their appearance. Harsh. Some of the most wealthy men in the area would come to the auction to find the most attractive girl possible, but even some of the men without a bunch of money came to bid a bit later in the game. In our number five spot today, we have wedding baths. This is one of the most serious of all of the wedding traditions that were seen in ancient Greece, and it was a key part of the pre-wedding rituals for brides-to-be. This ritual bath involved water being carried in a special ceremonial vase called the lutrophore to the bride's chamber for this bathing practice. This ritual was actually so important to the people of the time that much of the time, should a young woman meet an untimely fate before being married, they would still perform this bathing ritual on the woman post-mortem. Sometimes they would even be buried with the ceremonial vase as well, even though they had never had the chance to marry. This ceremony was intended to purify the bride and also to enhance her ability to have children. It was seen as the most important milestone in a girl's journey from adolescence into adulthood. In our number four spot today, we have courtly love. So we've discussed a bit about how medieval marriages were mostly about the transferring of wealth and land and really didn't have much, if anything, to do with love. This would obviously be a less than ideal way of living, so to make things a little more bearable, there was the practice of courtly love. This, of course, was for members of the court and it allowed lords and ladies to experience love despite their marital status. This was actually a huge hit and so many people became involved that there ended up being a list of rules posted, one of which included the rule, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. The courtly love saw people doing things such as dancing and giggling, and if they really wanted to get a little risque, they'd even hold hands. 
sex of course was forbidden however because there are some boundaries while you're married all right it's just sad that people were in these loveless marriages and had to resort to things like this all because they simply weren't allowed to marry for love I am glad though that they were able to have some kind of freedom I guess in our number three spot today we have double consanguinity double consanguinity is the case that comes up when there is consanguinity from two sources meaning some sort of familial relationship from two places. This was important in medieval times because it was common for two siblings in one royal family to marry two siblings from another royal family. The children of these couples would be considered double first cousins. They would be allowed to marry as first cousins, but they technically had an even closer biological relationship than first cousins did. This might be a little strange to a lot of us now, based on most of our ways of living and the law, but these rules were formed before the concept of genetic relationships and DNA was even known, so there of course would seemingly be nothing wrong with it during those times in history. In our number two spot today, we have the Viking Party. Okay, we've all been to a wedding before where we maybe got a little too loose, had a little too much fun, but let me tell you right now, no one did it like the Vikings. An important aspect of a Viking wedding ceremony was mead. It was a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink a specially brewed bride ale together at the feast that took place after the wedding ceremony. It was an important step and making sure that the marriage was a binding one. The happy couple would need to ensure that there was at least a month's worth of ale ready for the wedding day, and it needed to be continually drunk throughout their honeymoon as well. The first serving of the bride ale was presented to the groom by his new wife in what was known as the loving cup. Before the groom takes his first sip, he would likely consecrate the ale to Thor by making the sign of a hammer over it and a toast to Odin. Then he would sip the ale before passing the cup to his wife. She would then make a toast to Freya before having her sip and then it was officially party time. In our number one spot today we have purity. Of course women have been subject to the weird standards of purity for hundreds and hundreds of years but it was so bad in the medieval times that it was very common for women to have to take a type of purity test in order to assure her new husband. We won't get into the multitude of reasons why that is both horrible and extremely bizarre because we would be here all day, but I will talk about this test that they felt necessary to do. For royals, the wedding night was usually watched by observers, which is very weird, but in an even weirder turn of events, after the marriage was consummated, it was normal for the sheets to be checked for blood. For people who were lower class, they didn't usually have observers, but there was apparently a rule for these couples that would allow the local ruler to have sex with the bride on her wedding night before the groom. But this is debated by some historians, and I truly hope that this one is actually untrue. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Wards of the King. This messed up marriage tradition comes from the Dark Ages, the medieval times, and during these times, since people were seen less as people and more as what they can provide, orphans who were wealthy female heiresses, as well as wealthy widows, all became Wards of the King. That is dark in itself, but since marriage is all about money, the king used these people to his advantage. Advantage. These women could be married off to the men of the court who wanted to increase their wealth and land, or a lord who would also be able to sell her marriage to the highest bidder in order to make up for the loss of income she would have provided. If one of these women went and married someone on her own accord, she would then lose the money that was rightfully hers. How absolutely backwards is that? In our number 9 spot today, we have the Bridal Bouquet. The Bridal Bouquet is definitely a classic staple in Western society now, but it wasn't always just a nice aesthetic touch. The idea of the Bridal Bouquet has a much different history. It is said that ancient Greek brides would often wear wreaths of mint and marigold meant to serve as an aphrodisiac for the newlyweds, but I want to take us over to the Middle Ages. During this time, things and people were filthy. The concept of hygiene didn't really exist in the way that it does now and this meant that people were usually pretty smelly. This is why it became tradition for brides walking down the aisle to carry a bouquet that was full of herbs like dill and garlic. The bouquet served as a sort of deodorant for the bride, and it also worked to ward off evil spirits. Sort of like an awesome two for one deal right there in one bouquet. Dill was also like a triple whammy because apparently it too is considered an aphrodisiac. So having some on hand post nuptials pre consummation was just the icing on the cake for the pair. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different. And 
was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. Number 7. A June Wedding As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then, so when majority of the population did finally you know, wash up. At the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen. Everybody smelled nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well, other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse but back then you didn't get any Thing, and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky, who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. Number five, a toast. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches or the toasts. They're always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears. You're like, why, why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't want to do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the sixth century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then, they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number four, transaction. I find it to be just a little bit messed up how before now, marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time, people didn't get to choose who they got to marry and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away, so to speak. In the past, fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement, like X amount of money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number three, wedding cake. As the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored. Then the oldest, well, they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well, that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. 
It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you were going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. Very metal, very real. <laughs> Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece, where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits. But a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my God, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Finger just disappears, you're like, what the f these Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them. A little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength, because they were rock hard and obviously you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later, but later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, <laughs> OMG wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of 50 Shades of Grey, and Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation, so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirm that everything happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But, uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate, that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. 
The groom was expected to pay a sum, either in assets or money, to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. Five. And speaking of, number eight will be about marriage to the ex-youth. Uh oh. If you can put together what I mean by that, y'all know this was a tabloid nightmare. Claus von Amsberg wasn't exactly the spouse people had in mind for the then princess future queen Beatrix of Netherlands. After all, when Claus was younger, he was a member of the Schmittler Youth and later German Army. This was already a problem for plenty of reasons, but the Dutch capital had lost pretty much all of its Jewish population to the horrific oppression and the now finished war. The romance sparked a storm of protest in the Netherlands as a result. Claus was a low-ranking West German diplomat when he first met Beatrix, the then-crowned princess, on a Swiss ski slope during a winter holiday in February of 1965. They kept things on the DL until she warmed her parents up to the idea of meeting him, and to the surprise of many, Queen Juliana and her husband, Prince Bernhard, approved the match. Maybe it was because Bernhard himself was German-born, or their love was really that swaying, but I'd say part of it was the man himself. Claus initially was regarded as stiff and stern, and he worked really hard to shake off the habit he'd learned in his youth. And be vulnerable, showing a playful side to the public. He flouted royal protocol by removing a necktie during his speech and gave rides on the back of his bike during his wife's birthday. He also made himself favorable by mastering the Dutch language and learning to speak it with very little trace of a German accent. That, and he did give the Netherlands their first male heir in nearly a century. Well, he didn't produce it, Beatrix did, he just helped, you know, he's just Ken. The two remained married until his death in 2002. Now here is a name we all know well, but not for this reason. Number seven is Wed in Absentasia. Marie Antoinette and Louis were married before they ever even met. On April 19th, 1770 in Vienna, Marie's older brother, Archduke Ferdinand, was the stand-in for her soon-to-be groom. Ferdinand literally stood at the altar as Mary walked down. They exchanged their vows, exchanged the rings, juries out on if the kiss part happened, but it was actually two days later that Marie left the country for the real deal wedding and groom. If you want to learn more about being wedded in Absentasia, how that works and where it comes from, check Got my recent vid, the top 10 messed up marriage traditions in ancient Rome. It's on May 16th of 1770 that she and Louis are finally properly married at Versailles, a day after meeting for the first time in person. As was the custom, the groom's grandfather accompanied the newlyweds to the bedchamber. He blessed their bed, kissed them both, left them to produce a royal heir. However, this teenage couple was hiding a dark secret behind bedroom doors. Not only did they not have a baby, but they didn't even try. The couple didn't consummate their marriage for seven years, and it caused a massive scandal. How could they not produce an heir? It was her job as a queen, and Louis need to maintain the royal lineage. Historians have speculated why the couple didn't consummate their marriage all that time. So did the public in the 1700s, but the reasons are usually dumb witchcraft stuff. Nowadays it's assumed maybe Louis had a condition that affected his abilities, or maybe she experienced too much pain when they were trying. Honest answer? I think it's because they were young, the two probably weren't ready, and puberty probably hadn't done its thing and given them the drive. Either way, scandal ensued, and the story ultimately ends with heads rolling. This modern blonde is a different Different story, however, because she came just short of being the, the runaway bride. Number six. As a wedding planner myself, I can tell y'all it's supposed to be tears of joy on your wedding day, not tears of get this bastard away from me right now, so help me God. Which was kind of the vibe that Prince Charlene of Monaco's wedding to Prince Albert II gave. Prince Albert and then Charlene Whitstock met in 2007 at the Mer Nostrum International Swimming Meet in Monaco when Charlene was an Olympic swimmer. They were engaged by 2010 but unfortunately Albert really liked having extramarital affairs. He had two children out of wedlock, as is, and then, per Vanity Fair to quote, days before the wedding it was reported that the future bride had attempted to flee Monaco after discovering that Albert, already the father of two illegitimate children, had fathered a third love child during their five year courtship. Then the video footage of their wedding on July 1st of 2011 pops up and the bride has just Falling. Photos where she isn't, it's evident her smile is painfully forced. Post wedding and the paternity lawsuit thrown at Albert, Charlene has gone on to insist that the wedding was the happiest day of her life and she felt absolutely zero despair. Her crying was the result of being overwhelmed. Since plenty of rumors of more affairs, potential divorce, and separate homes have arisen, nothing can be confirmed nor denied. And the couple remains married, raising twins. Here's a fun one number five, the Cougar Duchess. According to the Guinness Book of 
of world records, nobody on earth has held as many titles as the Duchess of Alba named Marie. She was known as a mover and shaker in the European social scene and regularly rubbed shoulders with everyone from royalty to Hollywood stars to ordinary people. With her striking frizzy hair, sometimes dyed red and most of the time white, Maria always displayed an eccentric, often outrageous fashion style. Throughout her 70s and 80s, she wore fishnet stockings and beaded anklets, paired with loud dresses and lavish designer jackets. In other terms, she's your aunt that refuses to age, has no kids, a cool crib, and pulls up to the family function in a fur coat and leather skinnies at age 88. She was a badass. She was also married three times and widowed twice. What caught the public eye was that husband one and two were both younger than Maria. The second husband by 11 years, and then the husband she was married to until she died, that's the one that caused scandal. He was 25 years her junior, Alfonso Carabantes. Spanish King Juan Carlos openly labels Alfonso as a gold digger, hoping to get his hands on Maria's extensive fortune. All of six of her kids are horrified and do the most to try and stop the wedding. But the Duchess told Spanish radio, all of her children have been divorced, so they have no right to give her lectures on morality. I don't know why my children are causing problems. We aren't hurting anyone. Alfonso doesn't want anything. He's renounced everything. He doesn't want anything but me she said. The couple was said to have had a super happy marriage until her death three years later in November of 2019. And speaking of age, how about the new religion in at number four? At the beginning of Henry VIII's reign in 1509, the British crown showed no signs of wanting to leave Catholicism. Yet when Henry started pining for Anne Boleyn, who refused at first, like unlike the other courtly women and her own sister, to put out no matter what he did, it drove the man crazy with desire, right to the point he made the unprecedented decision to straight up divorce his first wife so he could marry Anne. The first wife wife, Catherine of Aragon, had been passed down like a family heirloom to Henry when his older brother Arthur died. Henry wasn't the biggest fan and had already been denied an annulment in 1527, so in 1533 Henry just married Anne in secret. She was already pregnant with Elizabeth and the ceremony took place in the middle of the night just before dawn at Whitehall. There was only four or five witnesses, mostly Henry's close friends, and then the marriage was kept under the strictest secrecy because Henry of course didn't have permission from the Pope to divorce, let alone remarry. When the Pope raises a fuss, Henry's reaction is to just casually declare himself the head of the Church of England and completely splinter the religion from Rome, thus starting a whole new branch of a religious faith. As if forcing an entire country to switch religions for your marriage wasn't controversial enough, he later beheaded his wife for reportedly cheating on him. Number three is kind of a cute story, the coupon dress. Though you wouldn't guess it by looking at the dress because honestly it's the best royal wedding dress I've seen come out of British monarchy. But did you know due to the wedding, uh, due to the post-war austerity measures, Princess Elizabeth had to use clothing ration coupons to buy her dress. Determined to get her dream dress despite the doom and gloom the empire was recovering from, Elizabeth, who was just a princess at the time, saved up clothing coupons in order to pay for the materials. She received an additional 200 as a gift from the government and most iconically, Brides to be all around England, excited about her upcoming nuptials, sent her hundreds of their own coupons. Overwhelmed, Elizabeth made sure to return these coupons to every single woman who sent one, especially given it was illegal for them to be given away in the first place. The dress was designed by Norman Hartnell, and what he created was certainly fit for a queen. Chinese silk, high neckline, tailored bodice, and a classic fit and flare silhouette. The ivory silk gown had a 13 foot long train, with the pattern and style by a Boccacelli painting. The extra coupons, it said, went towards the extra materials needed to make it. It's incredible to think that the post-war restraint shown by the Queen in the last 1940s, less than a decade before her coronation. The scandalous nature of using coupons for a dress ironically was an afterthought, mostly pulled up once she became Queen much later to try and besmear her for cheapness. Speaking of Elizabeth, for number two we'll talk about the snub. I don't care for royal drama, but the world knows that Diana was a gem, so Camilla can eat it. As you know, Diana was the lovely bride of Charles the gross cheating weasel. To play devil's advocate, he always wanted Camilla and only her. The queen and other royals kept them apart and as a result, poor Diana suffered. Once she met her tragic end, Charles went happily about doting on Camilla as per usual. And now in recent times, as we all know, he married her. That's really it. That's the scandal. Everyone hates these two so much, their marriage alone caused fury amongst everyone, including Elizabeth, who only begrudgingly allowed Charles to finally marry Camilla. Someone Elizabeth called that wicked woman and openly stated, I want nothing to do with her. And number one on the countdown, will it be Catholic or cousin? Which is worse, guys? Which would you rather marry? Well, in 2023, there's nothing wrong with marrying the first option, but you should not be considering the second. Don't do that. But George IV, Prince of Wales, decided 
married both. In 1785, George secretly married Maria Fitzherbert, a twice divorced commoner. <gasps> I know. To make matters worse, she was Catholic. So not only was this match not approved, but at the time it was super illegal and technically made their marriage invalid. Well, courts and commoners and nobles alike berated the couple and scathingly referred to Maria as a mistress instead of their queen, these two lived happily together for a super long time. But the prince was a tad broke. He spent all his winnings lavishly and in order to settle the debts he built, the parliament concocted a rather evil scheme. We'll pay it off, give you a new fortune, but you have to publicly deny being married to Maria. Well. He left her high and dry, that's to say the least. George is then set up by the same parliament with a dashing young lass, his first cousin, named Princess Caroline of Brunswick. The two were not attracted to each other, had nothing in common, nothing to talk about, didn't even like each other. A match made in heaven, obviously. They agreed to a marriage which was commenced on the 8th of April, 1795, the first day they ever meet in person. Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of, more about personal hygiene now than we did you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys. It's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst. You gotta get up, walk down that long, scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy. Heads up. Oh, oops. <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes, if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time, it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. And that's when number eight comes in, the best man. So before the theft was a reenactment and it was still the real deal stuff, the best man and or groomsmen were crucial. If a bride's family was to steal back their daughter before the consummation occurs, this man or men's per was to literally guard the bride and fight her family. That's why he was called a best man. He was usually whatever man the groom knew who was best at fighting. And if he didn't want to risk getting his own butt kicked, well, he better bring his groom's men. The more, the better. According to country living, the presence of groomsmen and best men was also to ensure that the bride, who in many situations was literally stolen, didn't make a break for it herself. This is why the best man stands up there next to the groom and bride instead of behind the door frame with a baseball bat waiting for his homie's new father-in-law to come break down the door. If a fight's going to break out, you need your best fighter right there ready to go or to tackle a runaway bride. Stolen or not, once you're married, it's time for number seven, the darkened threshold. The practice of the groom carrying the bride across the threshold of their new home or bedroom doorway dates back to the forcible actions taken on the Sabines as they fought tooth and nail to escape the soldiers. When it evolved and became part of a reenactment, the brides would continue to be carried through the threshold, but with a lot more steps in the process. So after that long and dramatic reenactment procession I mentioned, and the guests and the groom whipping walnuts at her the whole time to represent leaving childish things behind, since nuts, which was its name, was a child's name in ancient Rome. The bride would then be put down outside the front door. She would oil the door's hinges with melted tallow, wolf fat, or olive oil to keep out sorcery. Then she would hang some woolen strips taken out of her elaborate hairstyle on the door as a symbol of her taking over the traditional wives duty of weaving wool, but also to 
to represent the scraps of material torn off of the Sabines. To go inside her new home, the groomsmen would then lift the bride over the threshold and into the house's atrium. The threshold was sacred to the goddess Vesta, so Romans believed that carrying the woman across the threshold would ensure she avoid tripping, a bad omen. This however is also a reference to the Sabine women being carried inside of captors' homes. Number 6, we move away from the Sabine reenactment specific traditions, it's now cuffed up. So fun fact, it was under Romans that the detailed legal requirements for engagements, weddings and divorce were first instituted. Given that marriage in ancient Rome was something that required strict adherence to law, it may not be surprising that it was also regarded as a contract, thus a ring was necessary. Women in ancient Rome society were given two wedding rings, an iron one and a gold one. The iron was stylized in the early times of Rome to look like or even act as a functioning key, indicating their husbands owned them and they were a homemaker. This ring was worn at home, whilst the second was worn in public to impress people. The most common type of ring associated with Roman marriages was the fede ring, which has a design showing a pair of clasped hands or an entwined couple. Less charming is how they're representative of a contract that's comparable to a farmer buying cows. The ring would act as a receipt and passing of ownership between the father to the future husband. That's why only women wore rings, because men weren't property. Going hand in hand with that last point is number 5, dowry on a finger. You know that whole selfish notion that if they really love you they'll spend a fortune on a ring because that's what you're worth? Guess where that comes from? Creepy, right? Nowadays it can be obvious from a ring how much someone paid for it, but back in ancient Rome looking at a ring was how you established how much a woman was worth. and you could base how much you should respect her on that. Cheap ring? That means a small dowry and an unworthy woman. Yikes. In fact, author Karen K. Hirsch notes that rings were often used for this purpose in regular business transactions in Rome, making it very possible they entered the wedding ceremony with that mindset around the 15th or 16th century. The groom would offer a ring as a sign of his serious intention, offering up some collateral that the bride could keep if he decided to back out of the engagement. Rings were sometimes used as a deposit on the expected dowry or as a simple payment to the bride as part of her acquisition. For number 4, if you got some bad luck, bouquet it. So having a pantheon of multiple gods is going to create some strong superstitions. Gods were jealous and had to be pacified with gifts and praise so that they would behave and grant wishes. Sometimes these gifts took the form of a handful of wheat or garlands and fragrant herbs. The origin of the bridal bouquet stems back to ancient Rome when bridal couples would weave greenery and blossoms into garlands and crowns scented with roses or orange blossoms, adding herbs to honor the gods and promote fertility and good fortune, says Valerie Gittleman. Strands of ivory illustrated the strong bond of matrimony and fidelity, while white blossoms symbolize sweetness and happiness. Sheaves of wheat, for example, symbolize plenty and good harvests, i.e. fertility, which alongside faithfulness were the topmost virtues of ancient marriage. These garlands would be found on the altar spaces on the groom's head, wound into the intricate six vestal bridal hairstyle, and naturally in the cluster the bride carries, all meant to ward off evil spirits that might try to harm her. Speaking of hair and bridal beauty, how about the Roman candle for number 3? I talked about the flamium in the last video about Roman marriage, but more so about what it represents and its purposes. As you may know, had you seen it, the flamium is a oak yellow color. However, it didn't start this way, rather as a vibrant orange red color designed to look like fire so it would scare off evil spirits. Also it does explain the name flamium to you. This flamium also covered the bride's entire body in a 3 60 style, and originally they were weighed down with like heavy leaf garlands, precious stones, real rocks if you're broke. This was to prevent her, or at least try to slow her down if she was to try and run away. Why the change to yellow? Sun fading on veils passed down through the centuries. The concern for evil spirits lessened. People liked the color mustard yellow. I don't know, take your pick. What stayed the same was having to use a billion pins to keep the damn thing on. Thankfully, the six braid vestal virgin hairstyle was conducive to that, but it was also conducive to hiding weapons. Circling us back to the Sabine and captured bride concept, before a bride was allowed into the marriage bed, it became code that all jewelry that could be used as a weapon by the bride would have to be removed, including hairpins, bracelets, rings, and necklaces. Turns out some smart ladies kept some blades between their veil and scalp to protect themselves from their unwanted husbands once behind closed doors. I'm sure their Sabine ancestors would have been proud of them. This one's a little odd, but you may now kiss the priest in at number 2. Pre-Christianity, kissing at Rome was actually a greeting. Before you picture a 
got hot and sloppy makeout sesh. That's not the case. I mean a peck or a little brushy brush of the lips. It was done between strangers, nobility, and family. Hell, they had to put laws in place to get people to stop laying them on each other when pandemics would break out so less people would die. It wasn't a romantic thing in the slightest. Common for friends to kiss one another's closed eyelids, necks, and mouths, and considered a great privilege to greet members of your own family with a kiss. This rule was not to be broken or followed incorrectly. As Christianity took root in ancient Rome, the act of kissing became shamed alongside nudity, intercourse, and just about anything that was natural. What did remain was the kiss of peace. These were initially acceptable between men and women, but over time Rome went from a kiss friendly to no tongue action township. Because God forbid you kiss someone thanks for the loaf of bread you bought and feel a tingle somewhere. I know you bought bread from her every day for the last 13 years before now and kissed her thanks every time, but you never know. Today could be the day you defy God and embrace the devil. Tisk tisk, Romans. Anyways, jokes aside, despite the casual greeting kiss and the romantic kisses before marriage being banned, the kiss of peace remained. And one of the times that that kiss happened was at the marriage ceremony, where the priest would turn to the groom and absolutely lay one on the guy. After that, the groom has to turn to the bride and give her some sloppy tongue action next. Idea was that the priest passed a blessing through his mouth to the grooms and the groom would pass it to the bride. Thus, why the groom can kiss the bride and not the other way around. And last but not least, it's everyone's favorite gals, the bridesmaids, number one. Bridesmaids are as much a sight to behold as the bride herself, mostly because back in the day, they dress almost exactly the same as the bride. Complete opposite of the downright offensive thing some of y'all have your best friends wear. Girl, if you love her, you wouldn't make her wear that shade of pink that she can't. Anyways, the Romans believed that the bride, being so pretty, is easy prey for vengeful spirits that would harm her. Thus, the bouquets, the flemium, and now the bridesmaids, aka decoy bride. These maidens' purposes were literally to confuse evil spirits. They would dress identical to each other in an outfit somewhat similar to the bride's own. Since the bridesmaids would be surrounding the bride and look so similar to one another, it was believed the evil spirits would become confused and fly off somewhere else. Reader's Digest also noted the use of bridesmaids in a similar fashion to the best man, confusing rival lovers or even criminals seeking to take the bride. As a result, the tradition of bridesmaids wearing identical dresses to the bride persisted until the 1880s. Of course, modern bridesmaids who consider the role less of an honor than a job with the terrible uniform should consider something else noted by Reader's Digest. In ancient times, bridesmaids were literally the bridesmaids. At least these days, you're getting drunk on a yacht with her. Yeah.